Hey everyone, welcome to Fellowship of the Frugal. My name is Daniel. In today's video, this is going to lay some groundwork that leads into the other videos that I have that are talking about life insurance. I lay some things down up front. So if you're watching this first before you see any of my other life insurance videos, this will be very helpful. Or if you've already watched some of the other ones and now are watching this, maybe it'll help clarify some of the assumptions that I make in those. But I'm going to talk about the fact that not all life insurance is created equal. I'm going to talk about stock versus mutual companies. I'm going to talk about living benefits versus death benefit. I'm going to talk about the possible outcomes of life insurance planning. I'm going to keep that very simple. I'm going to talk about the financial ratings of companies. And I'm going to talk about participating versus non-participating policies. But if that sounds confusing, trust me, it'll make more sense by the time this is done. And as always, if you find this helpful, be sure to click subscribe. Like, check out my other videos and I hope to see you around for some more as well in the near future. So I hope you enjoy. The first point I wanted to make about life insurance is that all life insurance is not created equal. So just like a car, just like with clothing, just like with anything that you buy, you're going to have a range of quality that you purchase and it's no different with life insurance. So like with an automobile, if you get the cheapest thing that you can buy, it's going to be very different than, say, a medium or the most expensive type of vehicle that you can buy. There's going to be some bells and whistles that aren't there on the cheapest model. Same with clothing. It may wear out much faster than a quality piece of clothing that you can purchase for more money. With life insurance, all companies are going to advertise that they have this particular term product or this particular product, period but it's not going to be the same across the board. You have to look at a few things and I'm going to talk through some of those. But just keep in mind, if there is a popular opinion out there that says that, for example, all whole life is trash, well, if you lump all of, of the possibilities together and look at the whole thing in a, with a blanket statement like that, then you can safely make a comment like that. But when you pull out the individual pieces and you see that not all life insurance policies are created equally and that there are varying companies, then you can then begin to pick out some, well, actually this one, this one is a pretty good one, or this one makes sense to do where some of them are not good products. And I would agree with that hundred percent. I've seen many of them, but I'm going to talk through what to look for with trying to get a good quality product. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is a stock versus a mutual company. Now all life insurance companies out there are going to be one of the two, either a stock company or a mutual company. So here's the difference. The stock company is traded on the stock market. It's owned by stockholders. So you don't have to be a policyholder to purchase into it. You can have stock in the company and be a part owner without having a policy yourself. And decisions are made to try to help with that stock price, obviously. With a mutual company, the policy owners own the company. So anybody that has a policy with that particular company is a part owner and gets a share in the ownership of that. Taking a step further, Typically what I've seen is mutual companies are the ones that will allow you to have a participating life insurance policy. Now, all I mean by that is that if dividends are declared, that there's a, there's a payment towards the policy holders for maybe a good profitable year, that can be shared with those who are in a participating policy. If your policy is a non-participating, it just means you don't share in the revenue or in the income of the company. I mean, you pay for the premium, then that's it. With a participating policy, you can, as you pay the premium, start to get some money back in addition to what's outlined in the policy illustration itself. So participating policies, from what I've seen, have a lot better growth within it because year in, year out, dividends can be declared. It's never promised, but there are plenty of companies that have declared dividends for a long consecutive time. And so policy owners get to share in that and increase the values within their policies. So back to what I said earlier about stock versus mutual companies, what I have typically seen is that if you have just say $100 worth of premium that you're going to use to buy a life insurance policy, or meaning a whole life policy, the stock companies tend to put more emphasis on the death benefit. In other words, you may be able to buy more death benefit with your $100 a month than you could with a mutual company. Now that's not always guaranteed, but that's just what I've typically seen. However, the living benefits tend to be better and more emphasized with a mutual company. So that same $100, it may not buy you as much of a death benefit, but if you end up living a long time, as I outlined later on in this video, 
then some of those internal values in the policy will actually be a lot better than they would be on a stock company for the same dollar amount. Now again, this is just typically what I've seen. I've seen many examples of different companies with policy illustrations. Stock usually emphasize death benefit. Mutual usually emphasize living benefit. But both of them will pay a tax-free death benefit. So that that's going to be the case. So don't worry about that part. But that's just some of the differences that I've seen between them that I wanted you to be aware of. Usually if you see the word mutual in the company name, it's a mutual company. And the way to determine if it's a stock company, you just do a search for that particular company and it'll say on their website somewhere, or you can search the company, then stock, and it'll say something about the, the symbol for that to be traded on the stock exchange. And that'll give you the answer of whether or not it's a stock company or not. But usually the word mutuals in there is mutual. That's not always the case. Like I know there are some that don't have mutual, but are mutual companies. You'll just have to take a step further to look into it to make sure. But I hope you find that piece helpful and the piece on participating versus non-participating because those are important parts because as I talk through my videos, I'm basically making an assumption of a mutual company because of the living benefits that are better. And I'm also making an assumption of participating policy. In other words, you can get more growth from your policy for the same dollar amount. Another thing I'll speak to is the financial rating of the company. So that's something to, to consider as well. Because you may see, in fact, in this picture I have right here, this shows the three rating companies of insurance companies. That's going to be S&P, it's going to be Moody's, and Fitch. Those are the three companies that do it. And you see this range of ratings. You'll see that the AAA rating at the top is the best, all the way down to a triple C down here at the bottom. So without knowing this, you may hear something like, hey, we're A rated, and you think, oh, well, just like my school days, A is good, so A would be a good company rating. Well, I'm not saying it's a bad rating. I'm just saying out of the possible number of rankings, that's sixth out of 18th if you had just a straight A rating, and you can do a lot better. You can do A plus, double A, on from there. So looking at a chart like this will help you determine if you see the rating for the company, how financially strong it is. And that's really all that these ratings mean is how sound financially the business is. Now that doesn't mean if it's A or A minus that it's going to fall apart tomorrow. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying some companies are stronger than others and there's going to be a difference in policy for that. A company that's AAA rated, you may pay more to get the same policy, but the backing behind it is going to be a lot stronger as opposed to a triple B company. There's, there's more risk the farther down you go on this scale. So that's a, a factor that affects premiums, it affects benefits. Well, my assumption is that you are purchasing from a strong financial company, maybe in the top six ratings or so, as you have your policy so that you get the best financial backing. So the next thing I want to talk about is the three possible outcomes of life insurance planning. Now here's, here's how I view this. Some financial planners will, will say different things, but this is how I'm going to assume going forward. So the first outcome is you buy life insurance and you die within the first 20 years. So the reason I'm assuming 20 years is because there's a lot of recommendations out there for a 20 year term and 20 is kind of a good time frame on achieving some sort of goal and those that push 20 year term policies are going to assume at the end of 20 years that you no longer need it. Well, if you purchase something life insurance wise and then you do die within the first 20 years, there's going to be that tax free death benefit that's going to help you with your overall planning on why you purchase that. So as far as a pure death benefit standpoint, if you do die within the first 20 years, the death benefit's going to be there. Your family's going to get to enjoy for the reasons as you purchase the policy. But the other possible outcomes, one is if you live past the 20 year time frame and you no longer need the life insurance. Well, if that's the case, then again, a term worked out just fine. It lasts you the 20 years and you don't need it anymore. Great. You're not spending any more money on the premium. Hopefully some of your investments and things did well. And so you no longer need that policy. But there's also a third option that I've actually seen a lot in my time in the field. And that is you live past the 20 year period, but you still need the life insurance. This is where it gets a little hairy, where if you had a 20 year term policy, but yet you still need coverage, can you get new coverage once you're 20 years up? Well, that depends. You have to be insurable at that time and you may or may not be. But with something like a whole life policy, if you still need the coverage, well, guess what? You still got it and your premium is not going to be any higher. If you had the 20 year term, 
it expired and you buy a new 20 year term, their premium is going to be a lot higher than it was if you're insurable at the end of that time versus having that whole life where you were insured the whole time and then you can continue that coverage down the road. I have seen numerous examples of people in their 60s, 70s that still need life insurance and they can't get it anymore because they follow the term plan and they can't buy more coverage so they just have to rely on savings which is not the best use of leverage and use of other people's money when it comes to doing things after your death for your family to enjoy from a financial standpoint. And the last thing that I'll allude to as I'm wrapping up this video is a living versus death benefits. So term insurance only has a death benefit. It only has whatever dollar amount that you purchase. If you die within the term, your family gets that death benefit. If you cancel the policy or live longer than the term, then there is no death benefit. There are no living benefits within term. You can't cash anything in for refund on premium. You can't take a loan against the policy. There's no non-forfeiture options. None of those things apply. But on permanent insurance, or on whole life as an example of permanent, there are living benefits. And I talk about those an awful lot because the assumption is that you're going to outlive that 20 year block that I just alluded to. All insurance companies have something called actuaries. They're scary good at what they do. They can tell you every year exactly how many of their policy owners are going to die. They just can't tell you who's going to die. And so when they price the premiums on these policies, the reason the term is so inexpensive is because they know there is a very low in the neighborhood of about a 1% chance that it's actually going to pay as opposed to a whole life, which is guaranteed to pay at some point because we're all going to die at some point. And so as the pricing goes into those things, that's something to consider as well is there are living benefits that I'm going to allude to a lot. Cash value growth, um, non-forfeiture options or uh, option to purchase additional uh, death benefit, just things like that that I'll explain more on, on other videos. But just, you know, up front, as I get into these, these are the things that I'm talking about. That you get life insurance, not just for the death benefit, but there's also a lot of living benefits that can go along with that. And I hope you take advantage of those. And one of my assumptions in at least talking with whole life is that there is going to be a participating policy that enjoys some of these living benefits that you can enjoy. So that way, no matter which of the three outcomes, you have that I mentioned, you would have benefited your or your family would have benefited financially from the decisions that you made. There's a 100% chance of that as opposed to a term policy where there's a much less chance that your family would benefit. And the only case that they would benefit would be in the event of your death, which is a whole nother. I mean, that's just one thing to think about financially, but it's a whole nother thing to think about emotionally and, and all these other things that may come along with that. So I try to have, as I have alluded to elsewhere, I try to have a big picture approach on talking about these things. And so as I go through my life insurance videos, I want to take all these things into consideration. This is so much more than just a commercial that says, hey, you can get a $500,000 term policy at your age for less than $20 a month. Get the cheapest possible policy here. There's a lot more to it than that. There are situations where you just need to get a short term policy for a, for however many years and if you don't end up using it great you had it just in case and those are fine but for most of us as we're doing these plans we need to account for the fact that what if the the unthinkable happens to us what happens to our plan what happens to our heirs and we want to leave something behind for those people but however hopefully what if we live throughout this whole thing and then live to a very ripe old retirement age do we still get to benefit from some of the premiums that we paid from the policy that we bought? So I'm going to give you answers on how to do that. So again, check out my other life insurance videos. I go into more depth on all these different areas, but this just lays some groundwork for the assumptions that I make as I go into these other videos. And I hope that that is helpful to you. Be sure to go check them out right now. And if you like any of them, be sure to subscribe and I hope to see you again in the future. Thank you.